Jesus, I will hold nothing back from you. Head, heart, and hands, I'm all in for you. Lead me, I will follow. Shape me, I'm moldable. Send me, I'll go. Jesus, your love consumes me. And now your love compels me to be all in the mission of making disciples of you. Good morning, DCC. Glad you guys are here today. We're in part four of our uh, current series, All In. Uh, Glad you're here for that. If today is your first time at DCC, we're honored you chose to hang out with us this morning. We appreciate that you're hanging out with us. Uh, We're going to start this morning by asking a question. Has life turned out the way you expected? That'll wake you up in the morning. Going a little more fun to start with. Has life turned out the way we expected? We've all imagined plans, futures, goals, purposes that didn't quite turn out the way we expected. Uh, We get to where down the road a few years older and like, that's not what I had planned. Welcome to the club. That's me too. It's not all of us. Uh, Things just don't turn out like we expect all the time. Uh, I believe all of us when we're growing up, we probably have some kind of aspiration to be something great, be someone great. We have some kind of hero, whether it's a sports star, a movie hero, a band, singer, something. We all look at and say, hey, I want to do something great like them. Maybe it's somebody that's powerful, money, somebody that impressed you when you were younger. Like, that's what I want to be growing up. I want to be great. I want to be something. But it just doesn't work out all the time. And that's okay. We all want to be something great. When I, you know, when I was about eight years old, I wanted to be Johnny Bench. If you're under 40, let me explain to you. Who Johnny Bench is? He was a catcher for the Cincinnati Reds back when they were good, back in the 1900s. (laughs) Around the 1970s, at his point in his career, he was the best catcher to ever play baseball. I loved baseball. I wanted to be Johnny Bench. He took the Reds to the World Series. He was on the All-Star team continually. He was on commercials, like NBA people on commercials now. Baseball people were actually on commercials back in the 1900s. Things changed. But I wanted to be him. And, you know, when I was 8, 9, 10, 11 years old, me and my friends would be playing in the field near our house. You know, we'd take turns pitching to each other and hitting. And when I was hitting, here's what was in my mind. Game 7 of the World Series, bottom of the ninth. We're down one. I'm Johnny Bench at bat. Joe Morgan's on second base. I work the couch 3-2, foul off a couple of pinches and crack one over the left field wall. Yeah, awesome, win the World Series. Wasn't that awesome? Come on, did I wake you up this morning? Yeah, awesome. It didn't really happen. It was in my mind. It's something I imagined that would be great in the future, but it didn't turn out that way. It didn't happen that way. Um, I believe we've all got expectations, have expectations, maybe had some and kind of give up on them, and that's okay. Um, We want it to be something great. I also believe that God still has something great for each and every one of us. I think the problem is we all want to be great at something we weren't meant to be great at. We want to do something we weren't made to do. Here's what happens. We fail to do great things because we're working in the wrong arena of life. I want to be Johnny Bench, but I was too short, too slow, too fat. My... Defense was awful. I could hit pretty decent, but I was never going to be a professional baseball player. And I could have kept working my life trying to be a professional baseball player and never made it. Never got there. I would have been disappointed. You know, a couple of years ago, I was speaking to the high school seniors here at their baccalaureate program. I was talking. I said, listen, you're getting some bad advice right now from adults. They're all telling you, you're graduating from high school. You can be anything you want to be. I said, that's a lie. It's all with great intentions, but you cannot be what you weren't created to be. you got to figure out what you were created to be to be great at it. We all know I can't be Johnny Bench as much as I want. When I was talking to those kids, I said, listen, y'all can't be president. None of y'all rich enough. 
It's true. We got to figure out what we were created to be great at. And if we don't, if we try to work in an arena of life that we just desire, you know, something we desire but not meant to be, we end up frustrated, disappointed, aggravated, and sometimes just want to drop the ball and quit. But I do believe that we are all called to do great things. The question is, are we willing to work in the arena of life that you were made to be great at? Are you willing to be great at the area you were meant to be great at? Are you willing to find your purpose? Are you willing to be great at being a spouse? Are you willing to be great at being a mom or a dad or a boss or an employee? The arena that you're in, are you willing to be great at it? Or do you have, well, that's not what I imagined, that's not what I desired, so I'm just going to all of it. Now, um, I'm going to be talking specifically to Christians here for a moment. So if you're not a Christian, I just kind of encourage you to explore what your creator made you to be. And what happens so, t- so many often is we need to go find ourselves to find what we're made to be. I think what really happens is we need to find our creator and see what he created us to be. Because as, we talk to, as I'm going to talk to Christians here, we know that, as it said in Ephesians 2.10, that we all were created for a purpose before we were born. The question is, are we willing to do that purpose? Are we willing to work in that area? So for the Christians in the room, are you working in the area God created you to be? Are you fulfilling the purpose God created for you before you were born? Now let me ask you, do you consider the works of Jesus to be great? Yes. yes. We all love the works of Jesus. The miracles. We turn the water to wine. Pretty awesome, especially for the people getting married. He fed the thousands. He fed 5,000 with a family meal from Long John Silver's. He fed 4,000 with about the same thing. We loved it when he healed the lame. They hopped up and walked. The blind could see. Dead people came back to life. That was pretty awesome. What? Was it pretty great things? Those were his miracles. Those were not his works. Let's kind of get on this page today. Those were Jesus' miracles that pointed to his work. Because Jesus' work was to come save you and me. His work was to pay for our sin that we couldn't cover. It was that. It was his work. He came to pay a debt that we couldn't cover. He came to make it so we could have a relationship with our creator, with God, so we can discover our purpose he created for us before we were born. So when we think about this work of Jesus, do we consider it pretty great? Or is it just me? Do we think the work of Jesus is like the second half of the UK game last night or the first half? The second, for sure. Here's the one thing I want you to know today. Here's the one thing I want you to walk out of here and get. One thing. You are destined to do greater things than Jesus. You are destined to do greater things than Jesus. Now, I know that is a big, hairy statement. They're like, how can you make that statement? I can make that statement because those are not my words. Those are Jesus' words. Okay? That's why I can say that. Me and you, everyone sitting here, we're designed, destined to do something greater than Jesus did. How's your work going? These aren't my words. These are Jesus' words. The week before his death, probably the night before his death, he was speaking to his disciples. He was kind of explaining to them, listen, I'm getting ready to go be with the Father. I got to go here so you all can carry on. And they're like, wait a minute, Jesus. We can't carry on without you. I mean, you're Jesus. We're following you. We need you to be able to do all this stuff. He said, no, listen, I have to go to the Father, and you know where I'm going to be, but this has to happen. Then here's what he says, John 14, 12. I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I'm going to be with the Father. We were 
called to do greater works than Jesus. Just wrapping your mind around that is kind of crazy sometimes. Now, what I want us to do with this um, verse is I want us to break it down. And I'm going to break it down, and, and part of the reason I want to do this is at home when you're reading your Bible, and I encourage you to be reading your Bible, break down what you're reading. Don't just read a verse, oh, that's cute. I don't remember that, but start thinking about it. Write down what we're doing. We're going to break this down a little bit. I tell you the truth. What does that mean? It means it's true. It's going to happen. It's a promise from Jesus. He's saying, this word I'm getting ready to tell you will pass. It will happen, and it will occur. Then he says, anyone who believes in me. Now, anyone means who? Anyone. It's not a special Greek or Hebrew word that we don't understand. Anyone means all. All of us who believe in me. Jesus is saying, listen, anyone who believes in me, this is going to happen. So if you call yourself a Christian, you're a part of that anyone. He says, we'll do the same works I have done. So he said, here's the truth what's going to happen. If you believe in me, you're going to do the same works I do. Now, here's where we kind of want to look at this, kind of pay attention. What are the same works as Jesus? What are the same works of Jesus? A lot of time we like to get held up on the miracles. Well, I can't do the miracles. I haven't. I haven't been given that gift of miracles yet either. But his singular work was to lead others to God through his death on the cross. He said, my job is to come to seek and to save the lost. That's my work. That's what Jesus said. I come to seek and to save the lost. And then the disciples, even when he was kind of talking about this, was arguing among themselves. Well, who's going to be the greatest? We want to do great things. Jesus said, no, no, no. You don't get it. To be great, you got to be the least. He goes on telling this, Matthew 20, 28. And I didn't write this down because I want you all to look it up. I want you all to spend some time today or this week to look up Matthew 20, 28. Jesus said this, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to what? Serve. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve others and give his life as a ransom for many. That was his purpose for coming. Jesus came to serve others and to give his life. He said, if you believe in me, you'll do the same works I came for. Are we playing in the same arena? Are we trying to be great in the same place as Jesus? Are we trying to be great somewhere else? That word ransom, he said he gave his life as a ransom. What it means, it means a payment for a prisoner. Jesus came to be a payment for us, prisoners to our sin. He came to die so we could be free, free from the sin that held us down. So if you call yourself a Christian, it's guts check time. You've got to be asking, am I doing the same works as Jesus? That's a tough question to ask. If the answer is no, we should be questioning, why not? Maybe we need to question, do I really believe? Maybe we should question, well, I believe, but I'm working in a different arena that I wasn't created to be working in. I'm trying to push for goals that really don't matter. What is it? Why why are we not working for the same works as Jesus? Then he goes on to the part that still blows my mind. And you're going to even do greater works. Now, every time I read this, I'm like, Jesus, there ain't no way. I am struggling enough to just to try to focus on doing the same works as you. How can I do greater works than you? I mean, I am not you. I am not God's son. I'm not part of the Trinity. I don't have the gift of miracles. How am I going to do greater works than you, Jesus? I mean, but let's get past the audacity of these words for a minute. I mean, can you believe Jesus said that? Let that sink in. Jesus said, you're going to do greater work than I did. 
What you did is going to be greater than I did. What you did are going to do, if we're in the same arena and you're doing the same works to me, you're going to do better at it than I did. To be greater than Jesus. I mean, that almost sounds sacrilegious to say that. And if it wasn't, Jesus for, if it wasn't for Jesus saying it, I wouldn't be saying it. To greater works. He's commissioning you and I to do something great. Who is he commissioning to do greater works than him? Anyone. Who is he commissioning to do greater works than him? Anyone who believes in him. Anyone who believes in him. He's telling us we were created for a purpose of accomplishing something spectacular. You were destined to do greater things than who? And that's also one of your answers on your hand out there. I'm making it easy. It's like a pop quiz where the teacher's telling you the answer. Who are you created to do greater things than? Jesus. Jesus. Let that soak in. How is this possible for us to do greater things than Jesus? What's a good thing? We ask, you're asking that because Jesus goes on to tell us. He says, because. Jesus answers that. He says, because I'm going to my Father. He said, you can do greater things than me because... I'm going to my father. And the disciples are like, where are you going, Jesus? He said, I'm going to my father, so y'all can do greater things than me. He's trying to wrap their hand, head around it. And here's the reason why. <clears throat> when Jesus went to the be, go to the, be the father, he sent us a ringer to be on our team. You know what a ringer is? We, I used to play, when I was young, teenager, 20s, played in a softball league of churches. There was this one church that always brought in ringers. They didn't go to church there, but they were some really good softball players, and they crushed us every time. That's a ringer. When Jesus went to heaven, he said, I'm sending you a ringer so you can be awesome, so you can do greater things than I did. He said, I have to go to the Father so you can get the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit cannot come down until I'm gone back to be with my Father. That's how we could do greater things. The Holy Spirit is in each and every one of us to do the same works as Jesus. That's how it's possible. The Holy Spirit came to everyone who believes to do his works. So instead, this is how it is greater. You had one Jesus doing great works. But when he left... You had a whole bunch of Christians full of the Holy Spirit doing the same works. You have one doing an awesome job, or you have an army of believers doing an awesome job. That's how it's greater. It's because of the multiplication. It's when you have everybody jumping in doing the same works, you can do greater things than one, even greater than Jesus. So which is more powerful, one really awesome person or an army of awesome people? the army is going to make the biggest difference. I mean, that's how we can radically change our world is by being an army of Jesus followers doing his work. And this army is called the church. He said, my thoughts, anyone who believes in me is the church. And this is the army, and this is how we change our world. That's how we do what he called us to do. We've heard it said, you've probably heard us say it from hear a lot, but Pastor Bill Hybels years ago made this quote, the local church is the hope of the world. The church has the ability to change the world, but more specifically, has to change, change your world, our world. What's your world? Your family, your friends, the people you hang out with every day, our community. We can do this with an army of people with the ringer, the Holy Spirit in them, doing the same work as Jesus. That's pretty awesome. So the question is how? How do we do the same work of Jesus? Not only the same works, but do it even greater than Jesus. He died for a purpose. He died for our freedom, remember that word ransom, to let a prisoner free. We were prisoners and now we're not. We're free. His death, burial, and resurrection removed the chains of sin from us, removed us from that prison. But his death wasn't so we can live however we want. 
His death gave us freedom to do greater things, greater works than him, not our own selfish desires. You're free for a purpose. He went through that for a reason. He died for us on the cross, not so we can just, hey, he paid for my sins, now I can do whatever I want. I can sin all I want because he paid for it, so there. He died for a purpose. The purpose is so we could do the works of Jesus. Now, the Apostle Paul kind of explains this purpose to us in the book of Galatians. Galatians 5.13, Paul tells us this. You, my brothers, were called to be free. Ain't that awesome? You're free. Paul said, hey, you're called to be free. Don't they get nobody excited? He didn't say, you were called to live in a dungeon. You were called to live miserable. You were called to follow a bunch of rules and not have any fun. Paul said, no, you were called to be free. But don't use your freedom to indulge in sinful nature. Rather, use your freedom for a purpose. Rather, serve one another in love. Why did Jesus die? What was his purpose for us? So we could do whatever we want? Follow our own desires or for a purpose. Serve one another. Our purpose is to serve one another. That's the purpose of your freedom and my freedom. It's not so we can just do whatever we want. So we can serve one another. And it's whatever area of life you are in. If you're a teacher, serve one another teaching. If you're a nurse, serve one another nursing. If you're a a coal miner, serve one another coal miner. Whatever your job is, wherever you're at, if you're a parent, serve one another being a parent. But that's your purpose. That's our purpose. That's how we change the world. That's how we do greater things than Jesus did. What we do is we leverage our freedom to serve others. That's how we do greater things than Jesus. Leveraging our freedom to serve others is how we do greater works than Jesus. The purpose he died for. The reason he was our ransom is to serve other people. That's how the church can become an army to change the world. Is when we serve others. Um, throughout the scripture, we're called to serve others. And there's two examples of it. Most of the time when Jesus is calling out, serve one another, most of the time he's actually referring to fellow Christians. Serving one another. And then often he's talking about serving those outside of the community of believers to help them find their needs. So when they find their needs, they can find Jesus. So they can be reconciled to God from their sins. It all works to a purpose. It's A, we don't serve only each other and forget about the outside. B, we don't only serve the outside and forget about taking care of each other. It's both. Because one, if we don't serve each other, why in the world would non-Christians even want to hang out with us? Because there's probably some non-Christians in this room right now thinking, that's exactly why I'm not a Christian. I see how you all treat each other. Try to be nice outside and do something good to make you feel good, but you all treat each each other like crap. Then there's others saying, well, you the church, and y'all just sit there and hang out each other, and you see people's needs out there, and you don't help them at all. Which is it? Yeah, it's both. Serve one another. That's how we can change the world. Well, here at DCC, we are all about the works of Jesus. And what we want to do is we want to be included in that promise of doing greater things in Jesus, because that's a promise. He said, if you believe, you will. He said, this is the truth. It's going to happen. We want to be included in that promise because it's going to happen. So in that promise of doing greater things than Jesus, we accomplish this by being all in. That's what we've been talking about for four weeks now. Getting all in so we can do what God created to do, so we can be the church God created to be, so we can make the change in our community that we were called to be. All in as individuals is necessary before we can be all in as a group. It takes all of us. 
You know, this series, we've been talking about five areas that we know will take us to be what we're called to be. Five areas that if we fulfill them, God will use us to do these greater things. Teaching, reaching, growing. Pastor Matt's talked about those past three weeks. Today we're talking about serving. Here's the thing about serving. If you don't serve, these other four aren't going to happen. If you don't serve, who's going to listen to you to be taught? If you don't serve, who's going to reach out? Well, somebody else will do it. If you don't serve, you will not grow. It is impossible to grow as a Christian by sitting there doing nothing. And if you don't grow as an individual, then the church doesn't grow corporately together. And if you don't serve, you're not going to give. Because it's all about me. Serving, I believe, is the key to all five of these. They're all necessary, but if you don't serve, the other four aren't aren't going to happen. Will not happen. Because serving is a sacrifice. Serving means we become the ransom for others. We like Jesus being the ransom for us, him paying for us to get out of jail free. But when he asked us to let someone else out of jail free, he's like, oh, Jesus, I'm busy. Let me check my calendar. We want to be recipients of that promise of doing greater things than Jesus. And that only happens when we're all in on all these areas. But we have got to be all in on serving. So let me ask. This is, question's coming. You know it's coming. Is your serving helping or hindering DCC to do the work of Jesus? Whew. It just got really quiet here. I mean, I cut this fog with a knife. Which is it? Too often I hear people's waiting for this spectacular opportunity to occur before they're willing to serve. Well, when there's something meaningful for me to help do, I'll do it. That other, somebody else will take care of all that stuff. I, need, I, need, I want to feed the 5,000. I want to help the sick get well. I want to see the lame walk. What about the deacons? Remember the first deacons called to the church? They were called to serve the widows. Somebody else can do that. What? Where you at? Do you help or you do hinder the work of Jesus at DCC? Here's the problem with work. It's a four-letter word. Work. We don't like that word too much. It is mundane. It requires effort. It can be tiring. But nothing goes forward without work. It even goes back to physics. Work is required for anything to move. But we so often, eh, we'll let somebody else do it. Work involves faithfulness, dedication, and sacrifice, but it leads to a purpose. So others can experience the same freedom in Christ that you and I have experienced. It's how we change our world. It's how we change our world. Now, here at DCC, listen, we are blessed to have some of the greatest servants, some of the greatest volunteers out there. I mean, we have some absolutely amazing people. Because if it wasn't for them, I don't think DCC would be getting to where it is. I mean, Pastor Matt and I are not the one that makes DCC happen. It's all of our volunteers. Because if it wasn't for them, nothing would happen. About uh, Give the volunteers a hand. That's right. People who volunteer, clap for them. About 35% of the people at 10 DCC serve in some capacity. And that's pretty awesome considering the averages for around the nation. Nationally, churches have about 18% of the people doing all the work. We're at 35%, and I believe that's why we've been starting to make a difference in our community. Because the 35% that like to get in and give in some capacity. However, 35% is not all in. 35% makes a splash, makes a ripple. We want to make a tidal wave in our community. We don't want a little splash or ripple. Being all in, saying, oh, yeah, we're all in. It's like if you're playing poker and you have a big old splash and put it up there, I'm betting it all. Then you take 70% of it back, eh, I'll leave you 30. That's not all in. 
It's hedging your bets. We want to be all in. We want to create a tidal wave in our community to make changes. We want to see the greater works than what Jesus caused to happen in our community. And that can only happen when we are all in. And not in the southern vernacular, that doesn't mean y'all. It means all y'all. You know what I'm talking about. Everybody, 100%, not 35. So if you currently serve at DCC, let me say thank you. You are the ones that make the wheels turn. Now, for those of you that attend DCC regularly, you call DCC your home church. If you're out and somebody is asking you to church, and you know, they're, you know what they're getting at is asking you to go to church with them, and then you, you say, oh, well, I go to DCC. If, this is, if you're in all, any of those categories and you don't serve, I ask you, why not? It's time to go to work. It's time to do the work of Jesus, and it's time to do the freedom for a purpose. Not your purpose, for Jesus' purpose. And I know this is some words that just are tough. And the last time I talked like this from stage, there was a guy who got mad at me, and it was actually cussed about me out in the public. And you know what? He left. You know what? That's okay, because he wasn't ready to do the works of Jesus. We don't need anybody that just wants to be on their own terms. So here's what I'm asking you today. If you want to use your freedom for the purpose of God, if you want to do the works of Jesus, I'm going to ask you to do one simple thing. Get out your Connect card, and when the buckets come around and do the offering, put hashtag serve on this part of it right there, okay? If you want to be a part of what we're doing at DCC, if you don't participate anywhere, put hashtag serve on there. Then on the back part where it says Connect card, fill that out legibly. And I say legibly because we get cards that's like, you can't read a word on it. Because if you fill this out, Pastor Matt or somebody from this week will be calling you and say, hey, here's where we have some needs at. Can I count you in on helping us here in this area? Now, if you, feel, if you put hashtag serve, but you don't fill that out, if you don't put an email or a phone number to be texted or to call, you're not serious about it. Be serious about it. Put your name where we can read it and your contact information where it's legible. Otherwise, you're just making yourself feel a little bit better by dropping it in there, or you're hoping your neighbor will see you drop that card in there, and they're going, thank you're doing something awesome, right? Let's be serious about this. Here's the thing. DCC is called to do greater works than Jesus. But that only happens when we join together as an army of Jesus' followers for one purpose. What we need, what we need everybody to do is trust the leaders of this church to place you in an area of need so we can make the greatest difference in our community. We want to create a tidal wave in our community. And a lot of people say, well, if I could do it this way instead of the way they want me to do it, I would do it. We need to trust the leaders that have a plan for us all to get going in the same direction, not only when it's something I want to do or when they do it my way. If you want to do it your way, listen, leave. I know people who... Our Christians, and they love to do Christian stuff out in the environment. They well, I don't go to church because I just don't like church. I don't like the organized part of it. You know what you're saying? I'm all right with doing my purpose. I'm all right with feeding the 5,000, but the work that it takes to lead people to God, somebody else can do that. We need to all be all in with the same purpose, the same goals. There's the calling excuse. Well, when there's something available with my calling, I would be glad to serve. You know, I love that. Well, I'm waiting to where my spiritual gifts can be best used. If your house is flooding, you got a leak, you got a busted pipe, are you going to go turn off the main water valve, or are you going to say, well, i got to wait on the plumber to get here to go turn that nozzle because I just it's not my calling, it's not my job. I'm not a plumber, I'm not a licensed plumber. I'm just going to let the house flood. Do you do that, or do you go turn off the main valve and then let the plumber come and fix the problem? If your house, if you got a little fire going, something catches on fire in your house, do you go and grab the fire extinguisher and put it out? Or you say, Phew. well, I hope the house don't burn down before the fire department gets here. Which do you do? There's needs around here. I, there's diapers that need to be changed in the nursery. Because there's mamas come in here that are desperate. They're on the last edge, and they need to hear about Jesus. But if 
there ain't nobody in the nursery or they go there and there's not anybody there because whoever didn't show up that day or nobody wanted to work that day is not there, that woman's not going to get here about Jesus. There needs to be greeters out in the parking lot because there's going to be somebody coming in, has happened here, ready to kill themselves until they, came, until they came to DCC, more than once. But because the faces they incurred as they came into those doors and everything that happened in here, because everybody, not because mine or Pastor Matt's message was so awesome, but because every single lay person they encouraged, encountered from the doors through the lobby to the worship, all of that changed their mind. So every single job matters. It's not, well, not when I can do something significant. It matters. If you've been to DCC for a number of years, you've heard us say this several ways. I mean, we've said, save people, serve people. You're wired to serve. Strategic service. These are all things we've used in the past, over the past seven years, to talk about serving at DCC. But whatever catchy term we try to say, it comes down to this. Are you using your freedom in Christ for a purpose, or are you wasting your freedom? That's what it boils down to. I understand time is limited. We all are just booked to the max. However, what do you want to do with your time on earth? Do you want it to matter? Do you want it to have a purpose to do greater things than Jesus or your purpose? By working together together, by serving one another, we can achieve greater things than Jesus. Those are his words, not mine. But after receiving, you know, before receiving the Holy Spirit in Jesus' ministry, he had about a 35-square-mile area of Jesus' ministry. He ended up having about 500 followers in Jesus' lifetime. That was Jesus' ministry while he was here. But after he left, the Holy Spirit came to the believers, and Jesus' work grew. While Jesus was alive, it was small, hundreds. After he died, after Jesus died, you know, we can't do this study Jesus. After he died, it exploded. Christians came by the thousands. It grew and grew and grew. Over time, over the past 2,000 years, it's been millions and billions it spread south to the African continent. It spread north up through the Middle East, through Europe, across the Mediterranean Sea, across the Atlantic Ocean, to North and South America, across the sands of our East Coast, up the hills of Appalachia, and back down to the hills of Appalachia is what's happened when the Holy Spirit came. When Jesus was here, a little 35 square mile in the Middle East. But it spread everywhere once the Holy Spirit came because greater things occur... When the church becomes an army. Being free for a purpose is the way the local church can change the world. By using our freedom for a purpose of serving others is how we change our world, not just the world, our community, our family, our friends. Those that are closest to you can experience the life-changing power of Jesus. They can experience the freedom of Jesus. At your spouse, your children, your parents, your siblings, cousins. It's your family. That's your world because you're willing to serve. Those you hang out with ball games, those parents you talk with, those you're hanging out at other school functions, at work, friends you hang out with. It can be your classmates, your teammates, your coworkers. That's our world. And when they see you serving others, they realize, there's something about you that's different, and I think it's this Jesus thing. And then they get interested. And their eternity is going to be changed forever. They can receive the freedom of Jesus because of your work. Now imagine with me for a minute here. Imagine if we become an army to do this. Imagine with over a course of a year, each one of us just led one other person to accept Jesus because of our obedience to serve one another. Imagine that one person is one of the names on your impact list that you filled out the first week of this series. Somebody you love. Somebody that's close to you. 
come to know you, come to know Jesus because you served. Here's what it would look like mathematically. Multiplication. This is how Jesus' work spread from Jerusalem across the world. Right now we have about 100 or 200 adults attending. If each one of us, so both service combined, was responsible and led one other adult to Christ, that would be 400 next year. And then if the next year, us plus the new 200, all reach just one person, that's 800 people in two years. That's not a splash. That's not a ripple. That's starting to change your community. In three years, each person responsible, one person coming to Christ because you're serving. That's 1,600 people in three years. That's crazy. That's how the initial church grown. They had thousands coming by the day. Why? Because every single person chose to serve. A lot of people say, well, we'll go back to be like the Old Testament church. All right. Serve, sacrifice, and be a ransom for whoever's on your impact list. That's how you be like the Old Testament church. That's how we can change the world. That's how we can make things change. It's crazy what can happen when we all work for the same purpose. We can do greater things than Jesus did when he was here. That's what happens when those who have received the freedom of Christ use it for a purpose. Purpose of doing the works of Jesus, not their own purpose. Each of us can make a difference. Just one person this year can cause us to do greater things. Are you willing to serve? Are you all in? Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, thank you for being so awesome and gracious. Loving us so more than we deserve. That you were you you chose to be our ransom and die for us. Die for our freedom for a purpose. Not just so we can say, yeah, we're free and get to go to heaven. You died for our freedom so we could free others through you. Thank you for your word. Just show, showing us these crazy things, saying that we can do greater things than you. It sounds like blasphemy, but we know it's true because it comes from you. And it's possible. You give it to us in a promise. We come to you wanting to do greater things than you because you promised it. We're going to serve you. Thank you for each person in here. For those that stood up to want to be the change, Lord, I ask you to give them the boldness to continue to be bold just as they stood up today to be bold tomorrow and every day throughout the week for you. For those that don't know you, Lord, I ask that they just realize that you are our creator, that you do have a purpose for us in life, and they will accept you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.